Special Agent Kelly, have you had a moment now to review the exhibits I have given you? Yes, I have. Do those look familiar to you? Yes, they do. And what are those? Uh, the first group, uh, starting at 216, or excuse me, States Exhibit 216, going to uh, 237, are the photographs I took of that white uh, Dodge truck on April 1st of 2019, and then States Exhibits 238 through uh, 276 uh, would be the photographs I took of the white Dodge vehicle on April 2nd of 2018. So you already answered my questions for who took them, uh, where were they taken, when they were taken. Uh, are they a fair and accurate depiction of the, the scenes as you recall on April 1st of 2019 at Indigo Signs and then subsequently April 2nd, 2019 at the BCI garage? Yes, they are. Judge, at this time, I'd offer states exhibits 213 through 276 into evidence. Is it 213 or 216? 216. Just a couple questions. So to be clear, 216 through 237 are on April 1st at Indigo Signs? Correct. And the, and the balance, 238 through 276, are at Crime Bureau, correct? Correct. All right. And you're the photographer for all? Yes, sir. All right. No objection. Exhibits 216 through 276 will be received. Your Honor, permission to publish uh, 213 through 276 to the jury at this time. They're, they're the, the two that I had um, offered into evidence through the uh, Mr. Dent, or, um, Don Elias. Two that you're offering, you want to publish? Three additional ones on top of this. So it'd be. Can, can you restate or, that? It would be exhibit states exhibits 213 through 276. I'd ask permission to publish at this time. Okay, you want to publish all of them at this time? Um, I have, yes, yes. Well, they're all in evidence. I, I'm not sure how you're going to publish all of those at one time, but uh, you, you have permission to publish. Thank you, Judge. If, if, if. Special Agent Kelly, do you recognize this photo? Yes, I do. And was this the start of that first step that you testified to the jury of the start of processing a vehicle? Correct. This would be one of the overall photographs of that white Dodge truck uh, while it was parked at Indigo Signs. So would this be fair to say that this is just a, a large-scale um, overview of the vehicle at this time? Correct. And is this that same uh, vehicle? Yes, sir. And why was this photo taken? Uh, it is an, just an overall photograph of that vehicle from a different angle. And this is Exhibit 214, is that correct? Correct. And this is referencing Exhibit 215. Is this just an overall photo of the, the back side of the vehicle? Correct, with documentation of the North Dakota license plate on, on the vehicle. Referencing Exhibit 216, why did you take this photo? Well, this would be a mid-range photograph of observations of, uh, I assume uh, there'll be other photographs, but this is a mid-range uh, photograph of observations that I saw on the front uh, passenger side door. And what significant observations had you made? There are uh, obvious voids in the dirt on the uh, front driver's side door. Uh, in some of those voids, you can actually see a pattern in uh, some of the prints that are there. Uh, up more towards the chrome door handle, there's actually apparent blood staining on the door handle. From a law enforcement's perspective and based on your training experience, what do voids tend to tell you? Um, I guess uh, in, in this instance, um, voids in that dirt appears uh, 
to me to to be that that vehicle had been touched in that area relatively recently. Um, if it would have been driven on another dirty road or or through rain or mud, you would expect to see that there would be something over the top of of those voids. Um, in this instant, they looked relatively recent. Can you stand up and point to the area that that you're referencing on uh, the screen of two or the screen behind you on Exhibit Two Sixteen? Certainly. So these are the voids in the dirt that I was talking about. Um, if I believe there's other states exhibits that will show it closer up, but there's also a, a void here that has a uh, distinct pattern in that void in that dirt. Um, you can see some of the blood staining in this picture up closer at the top of that door handle. Is there a closer photo that you had taken representing that? I had taken one. I do believe I did see it uh, in the state's exhibits that were entered. Referencing state's exhibit 217, is this the, and 218, are those the two photos uh, showing the same void? Correct. And was there anything significant in State's Exhibit 217? Um, it, it typically, when I take photographs of a crime scene, there's overall photographs, there's mid-range photographs, and then there's closer-up photographs to make sure that, that it's being documented, the location of what I'm trying to, to show in those images. When looking closer at these voids, did you notice anything significant? Uh, again, there was um, blood or apparent blood in some of those voids. Um, in the form of those, uh, you can kind of see the swipes uh, in the voids that appear to be finger, uh, finger marks. Uh, and then also the fact that there's uh, kind of a uniform uh, pattern in the void below those uh, finger marks. And you had referenced a blood swipe, is that correct? Correct. Are there different types of blood stains to, I guess, from a blood stain analysis, is there different types of blood stains? Yes, there is. What are the different types of blood stains? Um, there's several of them. In this case, on the vehicle, um, I saw blood transfers, which is um, where something that has blood on it touches something, and then there's a transfer of the blood onto the uh, initial pristine uh, uh, surface. Um, talking about swipes in this instance, uh, it's where something that has blood on it is swiped across the surface and then blood is left. Usually there's some type of uh, apparent motion with it. And again, can you stand up and point it out to the jury uh, on the screen behind you in Exhibit 218? Certainly. So this specific area here is what I'm referring to as a swipe. You can see that there's blood um, going into motion, either right to left or left to right. In States Exhibit 219, what is this a photo of? This would be a closer up photograph of the front uh, driver's side door handle. And what brought your attention to take a photo of the door handle? There were blood transfers on the vehicle um, uh, above the door handle next to it, and I believe also uh, on the other side of it, so in between the actual chrome and the handle and the door itself. And was this on the passenger side, or was this on the driver's side? This would have been the front passenger side door. And then you had taken, you said, a closer photo? Correct. Is State's Exhibit 220 a closer photo of the same representation? Correct. This is just documenting the apparent blood staining uh, on the inside of that door handle. And what kind of um, blood transfers did you say this was? Uh, these ones appear that they have motion to it, so uh, I would say it's a swipe. In State's Exhibit 221, what was significant in this photo? Um, 
initially when I saw the chrome door handle, it looked like there might be a latent print, fingerprint or palm print on the chrome. Um, when I took this closer picture, I actually observed that there were uh, kind of reddish orange fibers um, in that door handle uh, in between the crack of the chrome and the plastic molding of the door handle and then also further uh, in this image to the right um, they're considerably smaller. Can you stand up and point those fibers out to the jury? Certainly. So specifically there's a kind of orange, you can see a curl here, fiber that initially caught my attention. Um, on this screen it's not a real good representation of it, but there are smaller orange fibers similar to the same color over it further in the chrome. And is that the piece of evidence that you have obtained in the previous exhibit that we had introduced? Most of it, yes. And you say most of it. What ended up happening to the rest of it? Uh, initially that um, larger uh, fiber that's there, I attempted to collect with a pair of sterile tweezers. Uh, unfortunately, uh, whatever was holding it uh, to the door handle had it bonded. As soon as I broke that bond with the, the tweezer, the wind blew it away. Uh, it was at that point that I decided to collect the rest of those fibers with lift tape. In States Exhibit 222, what does this photo show? Uh, this was intended to be a mid-range photograph of the driver's side uh, door. Uh, my exposure was uh, high on this one, so it actually washed out. Um, there are uh, apparent blood stains on that door as well. And you had ended up taking additional photos, is that correct? Yes, I did. Um, this is States Exhibit 223, an additional photo, a close range uh, photo of the driver's side door handle? It is. And did you see anything significant on that door handle? Uh, yes, so towards the center of that picture, again, this one is overexposed, but uh, it initially appeared that there might have been a latent print in blood in the chrome uh, at the center of that door handle. Um, we've taken a closer photograph of it. I don't believe it was a uh, fingerprint, the ridge detail was too uniform. Um, it, it wasn't as uh, with the ridges, loops, and whorls that you would expect to see in a, in a fingerprint. And what does that signify to you? Um, something else had it on there, possibly at the time I was thinking that it's maybe from a glove. And You had spoke previously that there was an additional photo, even closer view. Is this the closer view photo of the um, driver's side door handle with that print that you just described to us? Correct. And it's that's just the North Dakota Bureau um, ruler that's next to it, is that correct? Correct. That's a uh, scale that we include in those close photographs. Uh, if, if we're looking at doing a comparison of a fingerprint, um, we need a scale as reference in there, so if they do have a print to compare it to, we can make sure that it's a one-to-one -one photograph. Can you stand up, please, and show that area to the jury? Certainly. Again, on this uh, screen, some of this doesn't really show well, but uh, it's in this area here that I was trying to uh, document. And you can see that these are not perfectly straight lines, but they're, for the most part, spaced pretty evenly. And I would not expect to see that in an actual fingerprint. Judge, just briefly, um, can the parties approach? You can. I think this would probably be a good time to take our afternoon recess. So you can take the jury out. Please heed the admonition to not discuss the case amongst yourselves or with anyone else, do not form or express. Any opinions about the case tells, is given to you for your determination. We'll be in recess for 20 minutes.
All right, so you have been watching our live courtroom coverage out of North Dakota, North Dakota versus Chad Isaac. This is a case of a chiropractor and a veteran accused of quadruple murder. Just on the stand moments ago, you were listening to Troy Kelly with the Bureau of Criminal Investigations describing uh, some of his investigation of the crime scene, specifically a, a vehicle involved and, and obtaining kind of a, you know, any evidence he could, including from the blood there. As we take a closer look at this case, I'd like to bring in a guest analyst joining us at this hour. Uh, we have Philip Dubay joining us now from California. So as you've been watching, what, what are your initial thoughts? Well, by the way, how are you, Joy? Nice to see you. Nice to see you. <laughs> okay. uh, you know, this is, quite frankly, the prefatory stages. This is all introductory. It's going to link us eventually to a suspect and obviously to the defendant, to his apprehension, and obviously to the trial itself, how he landed here. Uh, what they are doing is very routine. They're explaining how uh, their investigation unfolded. They're obligated to document, log, and number all the exhibits, all the evidence collected, uh, create a paper trail so that there is no issues with the chain of custody and the foundation for that evidence for purposes of introducing it into evidence at trial. Uh, any uh, school defense attorney is going to object on you know, authentication, foundation grounds, and if that's not properly laid or established, the remedy is exclusion of the evidence. So, uh, you know, the prosecutor is just doing his job. It's, it's sort of dry right now. He has a very non-pulsating temperament, you know, frankly, uh, but he's just trying to lay the groundwork to finally linking everybody to Chad Isaac. Yes, and, and you know we see some activity in the courtroom uh, still, and, and the judge is on the the bench as well. Let's go ahead and go back live into court and listen. I'm sorry. You know what? We're, we're not able to listen at this very moment, so we'll we'll just have to update our viewers when we do get more information out of there. Sure. Um, so yes, I mean a, as you've been saying, I mean we've been hearing kind of just the the evidence being laid out here, and this is something that the state has to do. It's certainly not the most exciting uh, pieces of, of testimony that we've heard, because obviously yesterday we heard from uh, the widow of one of the victims here, but it, but it is foundational, and it's something that, that needs to be done, as you pointed out. One thing that I am curious about is where is the link to the defendant? Uh, that's what the defense is arguing. Yes, there's all this evidence that a horrific crime happened, but... Just came to our attention How does it tie back to the defendant? Like they were a little bit well, eventually what's going to happen is somebody is going to tie him to one of the vehicles. Uh, it's my understanding that the flow of the evidence is that a company car was used to leave that property management company. And I believe the evidence is going to point to Dr. Isaac having entered that car and driving away and ending up perhaps at a McDonald's or a parking lot and then entering into another vehicle. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what that other vehicle is. And then uh, a cop in traffic, I think, uh, once they find out that this homicide occurred and they see the video of this other car, realizes, oh, that's Dr. Isaac's car. Right. And then suddenly the further investigation unfolds. Yeah, and, and there is activity in the courtroom once again. Let's listen. In the morning and two in the afternoon. So that's what we're trying to do. But. Anything, anything else to put on the record before we take the rest of our recess? No, you're not. Okay. We'll come back about, I guess, about five after. Five hours. Okay. So, uh, obviously, a recess now underway in that case. And you are anticipating, uh, Philip, and, and I just want our viewers to know that you are an L.A. County public defender. Um, and being a public defender, you've got to have a, a keen sense of what the defense is going to, to try to do here. Uh, we've heard them repeatedly argue that there is a lack of physical evidence tying uh, this horrific crime back to Mr. Isaac. And also, they, they, they point very heavily to the, the lack of motive here. Do you think that the motive issue is very significant? Well, obviously, a jury is going to want to know why somebody would have committed a quadruple homicide. And I got to tell you, Joy, I've been practicing law now for 25 years. I have never, ever had a quadruple murder, ever. They're very rare. Once in a while, you'll get uh, a gang type killing where people are sprayed up in a hail of gunfire, but they truly are very rare. Um, you know, but here we are. 
you know. Uh, you know, obviously what the defense is going to want to do is try to say, look, why would this man do this? What is his connection to these people? But even assuming uh, that there is no motive, there's probably going to be ample circumstantial evidence to connect him to the commission of the crime. It's my understanding that one of the pieces of evidence that's coming in is that when they went to his house, uh, they found a knife in his washing machine, which was a little odd, uh, and they could smell bleach in the house, and that the clothing that uh, the perpetrator was wearing before going into that janitorial or that property management business on the morning of the homicide seemed to match the laundry that was in his washer and dryer. So the plot thickens, you know, as it were, and we're just, you know, in that accretion stage where we're watching bit by bit how the evidence is coming in. So for right now, it's a wait and see. But if they don't have... Uh, an alibi for him, or they can't point to some third party who would have done this, Dr. Isaac is in jeopardy. Okay, yeah, Philip. You know what? I do have to point out, if you came to my house on a Sunday when I'm doing cleaning, it might also smell like bleach, okay? <laughs> but, sure. But let's see how all the, all the puzzle pieces fit together. I want to play uh, from earlier a clip from Special Agent Joseph Ahrens uh, from the Bureau of Criminal Investigations there in North Dakota. Basically describe the scene of a struggle, a, a bullet hole in a hat. Uh, let's go ahead and listen. Special Agent Aarons, when you first observed that hat at the crime scene, what did you notice about it? That it was lying on the floor next to uh, William Cobb's head, and it was actually another agent that we were standing there looking at it, and he observed and pointed out something to me on that hat. What was he able to observe? He observed what he believed to be a bullet hole in the left side of that hat. As you look at that hat today, are you able to see that hole? I am. It might be difficult for the jury, but would you be able to hold that item up for them and point to where that hole is located? So here's the hat itself. Um, let's see if I can... Right there, I know it's hard to see, but is a hole in the band of that hat. Okay, Philip, so once again, um, it, it is compelling evidence. It's clear that this was a, a horrific crime scene, um, but the bullet in the hat doesn't necessarily mean that it was Chad Isaac. No, of course not. So that means that through ballistics and, you know, striations and tool marking evidence and uh, shell casing evidence, they're going to have to link that bullet hole to Dr. Isaac. So I anticipate that they're going to locate either a casing that's in his home or maybe in his car uh, or maybe gunshot residue that was on him or in the car or at his home to somehow tie him to it. But yes, for now, there's just simply not enough evidence to say beyond a reasonable doubt that he killed four people. But I got to tell you, you know, this was early in the morning. It looked like a real ambush. Either he went in there like Spider-Man or it truly was taking four people unawares at gunpoint. Yeah, I mean, well, his attorney said in uh, opening statements, the defense opening, that his clothes had no, no blood, that the guns were not connected to the bullets removed from the victims, that there was no DNA from his fingernails and the victim's fingernails. Um, so, it, it, you know... The defense, I, I'm not sure what we can anticipate out of their side of it, but do you anticipate that they're going to be calling their, their own witnesses to, to rebut everything that we're hearing right now? Well, you know, through cross-examination, they can establish through their criminalists, through the prosecution's criminalists and their ballistic experts, uh, that there is nothing tying the defendant to it. All they're going to say is that, yes, the fact of casings exist, casings were recovered, uh, they're technically legally irrelevant if there is no way to tie them to the defendant. It's just some, I don't want to call it collateral evidence, it's sort of misleading. At some point, you know, the jury has to be led to the defendant, otherwise the evidence is leading them astray. So I anticipate something a, a little more narrowly tailored pointing the finger at Dr. Isaac. Yeah, okay. And, and of course, we're going to continue our coverage of North Dakota versus Chad Isaac right here on Court TV. Thank you so much for your expertise, Attorney Philip DeBay, joining us. Um, and of course, we're going to bring you our other top legal stories where Court TV, your front row seat to justice.
Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Joy Lim Nakrin. Want to bring you this update now surrounding the sexual harassment allegations against New York Governor Andrew Cuomo. A woman who has accused him of groping her at the governor's state residence has now officially filed a criminal complaint against him. This is according to the Albany County Sheriff's Office. Now, this update comes on the heels of several high-profile Democrats, including House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, and Senator Kirsten Gillibrand, all joining President Joe Biden in calling for the governor to resign. Let's take one thing at a time here. I think he should resign. I understand that the state legislature may decide to impeach. I don't know that for fact. I've not read all that data. So this comes after the state attorney general released a report on conclusions of an extensive sexual harassment investigation. The independence investigation found that Governor Cuomo sexually harassed multiple women, many of whom were young women, by engaging in unwanted groping, kisses, hugging, and by making inappropriate comments. This 168 page report details how the governor allegedly sexually harassed multiple women, including both current and former employees. The report says the executive chamber was, quote, rife with fear and intimidation and a, quote, hostile work environment. None of this, none of this would have been illuminated if not for the heroic women who came forward. And I am inspired by all the brave women who came forward. But more importantly, I believe them. And I thank them for their bravery. The report also details at least one instance of retaliation after an employee came forward with harassment allegations. The governor has repeatedly argued that he did not intend to harass anyone and that he's sorry if his behavior with women was, quote, misinterpreted as unwanted flirtation. In response to the attorney general's report, the governor said this. First, I want you to know directly from me that I never touched anyone inappropriately or made inappropriate sexual advances. I am 63 years old. I have lived my entire adult life in public view. That is just not who I am. And that's not who I have ever been. Okay, so still with us, we have L.A. County Public Defender uh, Philip Dubé. Also, let's welcome trial attorney Nicholas Fortuna joining us once again. So, Nicholas, um, listening yep. to all of this, how much more serious has this become? I mean, now there's a criminal complaint that's been filed. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't see where uh, Governor Cuomo has any, any options at this point. If he doesn't resign, he'll be impeached. The evidence is overwhelming. The report, if you look closely at the 11 women, um, there's extensive evidence put together by the attorney general's office. Um, the criminal complaint might be a little bit tougher than, let's say, a civil action because uh, you have to prove intent, uh, intent on the part of uh, Cuomo, and that, that, that's an that's a extra step that you wouldn't have in a civil action. Um, nevertheless, I think the, it's starting to crumble around him. So he, he doesn't have much longer. Philip, do you agree? Well, you know, to be fair, politically, he's accountable to the electorate. They're essentially his boss. The attorney general cannot come in and say you're fired. He's an elected official. I just can't imagine with all this distraction how effective he can be with all these allegations. Now, to be fair, Merely filing a police report does not presume guilt. All it does is trigger an investigation. We don't know if charges are going to be filed based on that. Uh, th if there is no corroborating evidence, uh, you know, how are they going to be able to prove that a criminal act occurred beyond a reasonable doubt? Absent some type of witness uh, testimony or recording or certainly a confession or video, 
Uh, it sounds like they're going to have a hard time proving that, not have enough evidence to file. But what the police report does is it puts pressure on the governor maybe to throw in the towel. Yeah, I, I, so this aide who filed the report uh, has accused him of, in pretty graphic detail, uh, says that he, he reached under her shirt, fondling her when they were alone together at the executive mansion last year uh, and goes into some other detail as well. Uh, so hearing all that, Nicholas, I mean, do you think you mentioned the possibility of, of civil charge, civil uh, pursuit of this matter as well? If criminal charges don't succeed, can you envision that? Yeah, that at least uh, one of the uh, victims said that she intends to file a civil action against the governor. Yes, certainly I, I, I do. Um, there is, uh, if, if uh, all the evidence in the attorney general's report um, is to be believed, I, I think he has uh, significant problems as far as a civil action is concerned. The standard of proof is, is, is much lower than it is in a criminal proceeding and uh, and and the if anything the attorney general has uh, laid out a roadmap for a civil action for the victims Philip in the climate that we're in uh, post me Too movement do you think that it would just be best if the governor did just resign well that is such a good question you know a lot of it really depends on the actual evidence keep in mind joy uh, this was not immediately reported. Uh, prosecutors and even juries kind of look at late reporting of this nature with askance. I could actually see some jurors, assuming it even ever got that far, uh, that the filing of a police report is a motive for some type of civil advantage to kind of uh, create leverage to try to, you know, get some cash out of the deal. That would be how I would... Uh, argue it if I were defending him. Now, on the other hand, there's a whole body of science that deals with this whole phenomenon of late reporting for women. Um, there's so much stigmatization, there's humiliation, there's embarrassment, and certainly nobody wants any type of public obloquy or you know, notoriety or anything stemming from a complaint, so they'd rather keep it quiet and keep it to themselves and privately deal with it. But yes, with this Me Too movement, more and more women are coming out of the woodwork. There's support from women's organizations, from uh, feminist attorneys, of course, and of course, the public at large. The electorate oftentimes doesn't even want to deal with this. Mm, well, thank you so much, uh, Philip Dubay, L.A. County Deputy Public Defender and Trial Attorney Nicholas Fortuna for your expertise. We are seeing activity now in North Dakota as we continue to follow that state's case against Chad Isaac, accused of quadruple murder. Let's go back live into court. Thank you. Be seated, please. Okay, we have all of our jurors present, the defendant and the attorneys are present, so we'll go back on the record uh, for our afternoon session. Uh, Agent Kelly is still on the stand. I remind you, you are still under oath. Yes, sir. Mr. Gunderson, you may resume your direct examination. I believe we stopped on 224, or we, we finished 224, so we'll move to State's Exhibit 225. Um, is this the, the same area, maybe an overexposed photo, is that correct? Correct. This is still the driver's side door handle, um, but it is overexposed. Uh, I believe there's other pictures that show uh, some apparent blood staining. Moving to State's Exhibit 226, uh, what was significant in this photo? Uh, I believe this is me actually returning to the uh, front passenger side uh, door handle, and now this is just taking photographs with a scale in it for reference. And then the following slide, 227, that's just a closer version of that photo or representation? Correct. correct. Was, what was significant in 228, States Exhibit 228? This is another photograph of those fibers just with a scale. 
included. In States Exhibit 230, is this back now on the driver's side? Correct. And what was significant in this photo? Uh, there's a blood transfer or a blood swipe on the driver's side uh, door handle. Thirty-two, thirty-one, and states exhibit two thirty-two. What do those show? So, these are photographs of the driver's side door. Uh, below the door handle, there are voids in the dirt um, that appear to be fingerprints, or at least voids caused by fingers. In one of those voids, there was some ridge detail with some definition that appeared to be more consistent with an actual fingerprint. Um, upon taking um, a closer photograph with a scale. Um, it does indeed look like a fingerprint, but there isn't quite the quality of ridge details that uh, we like to see. And then in States Exhibit 233 and 234, was this simply just documentation of the inside of the vehicle? Correct. Since we weren't entering into the interior of the vehicle to do any processing, it was just uh, to take photographs to document the condition of the interior where we could. Switching now to States Exhibit 235 and 236, what was significant and why were these photos taken? Uh, these are photographs after I placed the integrity seals over the uh, seams of the doors uh, with my initials on them. <clears throat> and can you point those out for the jury, please? Certainly. Would you like me to stand up and? Yes, please. Okay. So at least on the um, passenger side of the vehicle, there are the red evidence tape stickers over the seat of the vehicles. And there's similar stickers on the driver's side as well. What kind of tape are used in those? Uh, it's tape that's given to us uh, for sealing up either evidence bags or, in this case, uh, to show integrity of those seals. Um, we'll actually use a magic marker and put our initials across the seam so if it's tampered with, broken, and attempted to be replaced then it would be hard for them to duplicate my initials. Switching to States Exhibit 237, what is this a photo depicting? Uh, this is just an overall documentation of the bed of the truck. And is this when it was being towed? Uh, just prior to it being towed, yes. And are, we'll, we'll move to States Exhibit uh, 238. Where is this location, or what is this location? This would be the secured BCI garage uh, where we did the additional processing of the white Dodge. And is that the same vehicle? Yes, it is. And is States Exhibits 238, 239, and 240 showing the same vehicle? Yes, they are. And going back to States Exhibit 238, um, are those evidence seals still sealed? Correct. That's what this photo or those photographs are documenting. And what was the the primary purpose of? I guess you you start processing on August second. What was the primary purpose? April second, excuse me. Um, what was the primary purpose at this time? We wanted to get this vehicle into a secured location where it was more controllable. Obviously, the previous day we experienced issues with um, the wind and other environmental issues. So uh, having this secured in an in, in indoor location, it was uh, easier for us to do the process. And had you used markings to mark the different areas of evidence at this time? Um, again, there was overall pictures uh, of the exterior vehicle taken again, um, uh, again with um, having it in this area, there's better lighting, easier for us to photograph this stuff. Um, obviously you saw in previous photographs there was overexposed ones. This was an opportunity to doc document those uh, apparent blood stains in a, in a better condition. Moving to states, uh, exhibits 241 and 242. What do those photos show? 
So these are locations that we previously talked about in the exterior photographs. Um, this is a way for us to document it because now we are actually going to attempt to do wet swab collection of these blood stains. Um, so by putting those scales in there gives us the opportunity to document the location better on the truck uh, and also to uh, aid with documentation once we collect those samples. And what do those numbers signify? Uh, they're basically just a, a numeric number that's ordered for us to keep track of um, these photographs compared to um, once the swabs are taken for it to be labeled on the evidence inventory and receipt form. So those are the numbers then that law enforcement use in their evidence inventory sheet? Oftentimes, yes. Flipping to States Exhibit 243, what does this photo show? This is a photograph documenting Special Agent Leonard's um, prior to taking the wet swab sample from uh, that marker at number one or the apparent blood stain on the driver's side uh, door. And then moving to States Exhibit 244, what is happening in this photo? The same process. It is documentation of the collection of the apparent blood stain at that scale uh, number two. Can you describe the object that's being used to obtain the evidence? Um, are you talking the cotton swab the in the photograph? The cotton swab and then what appears to be a cap. Can you describe what that is? Certainly. So um, we have sterile cotton swabs. As you can see in that picture, uh, the stick, if you will, is made of wood or the shaft of the, the cotton swab. Um, and this is a, a manufacturer. I don't know. Uh, what specifically company manufactures it, but there's basically a sleeve with a cap that we can slide down so we're able to do the wet swab sample, collect it, and in order to preserve that sample, we're able to slide that over the top. You can see um, the cap that's provided with it, and that just snaps over so it protects the, the sample within that tube. Um, switching to t 245, can you explain... Um, what evidence number three is? This is uh, previously discussed what initially was thought to be a possible fingerprint in blood on the driver's side door handle, um, but it has the uniform uh, pattern on it, leading me to think that it's, it's probably more consistent with a glove, um, and this is a collection of that uh, sample of that blood stain. So does law enforcement, I guess, convey to each other how um, and what, I guess, means of obtaining certain evidence would be best? Any of the, the agents, um, specifically me and uh, Special Agent Leonard's and the collection of this stuff have received training specific to the collection of, of this type of evidence. So if... A somebody sees that as a, a possible fingerprint and then is wondering why we're using a cotton swab. Why is that? Um, I guess if, if I'm understanding, uh, like we were talking about the latent prints that were lifted with tape rather than using that technique, um, there's a couple of different options when you have a latent fingerprint. Uh, you, you can collect it like we described earlier with fingerprint powder and where it can be lifted. Um, there's also the possibility of collecting an actual DNA sample from a latent fingerprint. Um, there is something that's called touch DNA, um, that there's a chance that skin <laughs> cells from our fingers may slough off and also be included in that fingerprint as well. Um, there's different uh, ideologies on, on whether it's better to try to attempt to collect it like that or to do the, the standard uh, fingerprint lift. In this case, there isn't the loops and whorls uh, that we would expect to see in, a, in an actual latent fingerprint, so uh, it was collected for its DNA value of, of the substance itself. Moving to States Exhibit 246. And 247. What is state's evidence number four? So this is the previously discussed fingerprint that appeared in the void or the mud on the 
uh, driver's side door. Um, again, we didn't uh, believe that there was enough ridge detail in there for it to be an evidentiary value for a comparison. Um, Plus, with it being in dirt rather than probably oils left behind, the fingerprint powder probably wasn't a, a real good choice of attempting to lift it. So we uh, believe that our best chance was the potential of any touch DNA within this, this latent print. So it was collected through a wet swab process. Moving to States Exhibits 249 and 250. Why oh, skip it? And 250. Skipping through 248, moving on to 249 and 250, uh, what is um, the item inventory number five? This is a, a blood, apparent blood stain that was on the uh, passenger side door, and this is Special Agent Leonard's collecting it through a wet swab. Uh, moving on to States Exhibit 251, what is Evidence inventory number six. This is uh, another apparent blood stain uh, on the passenger side door that's being collected through the wet swab by Special Agent Leonard's. And what kind of stain, are you able to see what kind of stain that could possibly be? It, it, this would be considered a swipe. And based on your training experience, what was a swipe again? <laughs> a swipe is where you have something that is carrying blood that touches up against something and usually there's motion involved in that. Moving on to States Exhibit 252. Can you describe what was happening in this photo? This is the uh, latent print. So this is the actual passenger side door handle after I applied uh, fingerprint powder to it. Um, through that process, it appeared that there was ridge detail that was on that door handle, and this is after it, that print has been lifted after uh, fingerprint powder has been applied. And you described how with the swabs, they can go back into their canister and that secures it. How does law enforcement secure uh, the piece of paper with the, the print on it? In this case, um, once the fingerprint powder print powder and latent print was lifted from the door handle. There was a, a backing that was applied to it. Uh, these are you know, commercially produced um, backings that are designed for this. Uh, the f lift tape is applied to that and then that is usually placed in uh, some type of an envelope and sealed. Moving on to States Exhibit 253. What is seen in uh, this photo? This is a photo of the voids on the passenger side door, um, specifically uh, pointing out the uniform pattern in the, in the voids below that scale. And was any evidence collected of um, number eight? I don't believe that there was any wet swab or any lift tape applied to that, no. And what was the reasoning behind that? Uh, to document the, that pattern in that void. Moving on to States Exhibits 254, 255, and 256, what was the reasons for taking these photos? These were just overall documentation of the interior of that vehicle since we were only able to do it through the front uh, windows out on the scene. Moving on to States Exhibit 257, what is portrayed in this photo? Uh, in this photo, there's a set of car keys that were laying on the front passenger floorboard. Uh, there was apparent blood on some of the keys in the uh, key fob. And um, moving on to States Exhibit 258, was that the other set of keys that was found? Yes, there was those total of, I believe, three key fobs. Um, the one in that image had one key fob on it, the previous picture actually had two different key fobs attached to the same key ring. Moving on to States Exhibit 259, what door are we looking at here? This is the interior of the front driver's door. And being that's in the interior, I don't believe that we've covered this, what is shown 
Moving to, I guess, States Exhibit 260 is, what is shown in States Exhibit 260? So at, at the door jam there, um, where that door would meet the B pillar in the, on the driver's side door, um, there was a blood, an apparent blood stain at that point. So that was collected with a wet swab. Moving on to States Exhibit 261, what is shown in evidence marker number 10? Uh, this is the driver's side window. Um, there is a blood transfer on that window. Uh, there's a piece of paper that we placed behind it to aid uh, just in photographing it, being able to see the, the blood transfer on that window. And that piece of evidence was collected? Correct, through a wet swab. Moving on to State's Exhibit 262, what is um, evidence marker number 11 show? Uh, this is the interior of the driver's side door, uh, just above the armrest. Uh, there was uh, apparent blood staining on that uh, full wood piece there, and that was collected through a wet swab sample. Moving on to State's Exhibits 263, 264, and 265, what's being portrayed uh, in these photos? So while we were doing the visual inspection of the interior of that vehicle, uh, during the processing of it, we did observe uh, similar reddish-orange fibers, several small ones, on the center console or center armrest uh, in the interior of that vehicle. Can you stand up and, and show them to the jury, please? Certainly. So there, this is the obviously a close-up of that center armrest, and you can see uh, all these little orange dots across pretty much the length of that. Those were the fibers that appeared similar to the fibers that we saw on the outside of the vehicle the previous day. What means did you um, take in gathering these pieces of fibers? These were collected with lift tape. And is that due to the size of the fiber? The surface area that it is and how small the fibers were, that was probably the easiest way to be able to collect as many of those as we could. And can you move to States Exhibit 266? Is this a photo showing you, uh, showing Special Agent Leonard's uh, lifting those? Correct. This is a photo uh, document his collection of those, uh, of Special Agent Leonard's collection of those fibers. And moving on to States Exhibit 267 and then 268 and 269, what is being portrayed in those photos? So this is obviously the steering wheel of the vehicle. Um, it doesn't show up real clear in those photographs, but if you look, there actually is an apparent blood stain um, on the steering wheel and it appears to have the similar pattern as that was on the window and also in the void in the uh, dirt on the passenger side door. I apologize, I, I should have probably gone one more further uh, showing States Exhibit 270. Is that the location of the, the area that you just described? Uh, the swab was taken of a larger area of the steering wheel to include that um, apparent blood stain. But this is showing the collection of that through the use of a wet swab sample. Moving on to States Exhibit 271, what was the evidence that was being collected in this photo? So there wasn't anything visibly observed on the, the gear selector shifting uh, knob there, but as I discussed earlier about the potential of touch DNA, if somebody touched that, there is a chance that skin cells sloughed off. And so we did conduct a wet swab of that in the event that that may be there. How long can law enforcement potentially get um, some skin cells that are left over from one of those prints? Um, I don't know if there's a specific, if we're talking like a shelf life of, of DNA, um, there's lots of different environmental conditions could affect the integrity of DNA or the degradation of it. Um, so I, I guess I don't know if there's a specific time. There's a lot of variables that that would probably relate to that. And if someone had gloves on, would there be any way of getting that type of evidence? There shouldn't be.
Moving on to States Exhibit 272 and 273, what was the evidence that was being collected in these photos? There was a blood transfer and apparent blood stain um, on the plastic molding below the, the steering column. Um, and so that was collected by Special Agent Leonard's through a wet swab sample. And what kind of blood stain what, would you describe this one as? Uh, this was just mostly just a blood transfer that didn't appear to be any motion or, or anything like that with it. And can you show that one to the jury, please? Certainly. The actual stain is right about in this area. Um, due to the seat, it was very difficult to get the camera to focus on the straight head-on picture of it. So um, it was more to document that stain it was being collected. And lastly, moving to States Exhibits 274, 275, and 276, what evidence was being collected in this photo? There was another apparent blood stain uh, left on the button to release the lid to the center console. And so this was documenting that, and Special Agent Leonard's collecting that with a wet swab sample. And moving back to States Exhibit 275, can you stand up and show that uh, portion to the jury, Certainly. please? The majority of the stain was towards the top of the button, but it did trail kind of off towards the side there. And after all this evidence was collected, was it secured? Correct. It was placed in uh, um, evidence bags or envelopes, sealed, and then it was uh, released to Special Agent Joe Aarons. With your training experience and after processing this vehicle, looking at the blood that was in the vehicle, could you determine whether this seemed as though the blood got there from a transfer or if there was uh, an incident that actually happened within the vehicle? With my training and experience, no, no, I, would object to speculation. I can go through some training experience. He's going to testify based on his training experience. I'm going to allow that. All right. Um, I would have expected to see um, some kind of um, blood spatter or pooling or um, something to that effect if, if there was some specific violent event that happened here. All of these um, apparent blood stains that we saw um, looked like there was some, of, um, some form of a transfer, whether it was just simply a touch that left blood behind or grabbing something and there being motion within it in a swipe stain. I didn't find any, or we didn't observe any small oval um, droplets or anything like that uh, within the vehicle or on the outside of the vehicle. With the process, I know we talked a little bit before we took our break that law enforcement uses gloves. Is that correct? Correct. Bring you back to that point. Um, what was what is the purpose of wearing gloves? Well, uh, obviously it's to protect ourselves, but mostly it's to make sure that we are not contaminating the scene, that we are collecting pristine samples of whatever it is that we're collecting. Um, like I talked about earlier, with each one of these collections. Um, S.A. Leonard's changed his gloves to make sure that there wasn't any kind of contamination or cross-contamination from one sample to the other. And you didn't touch um, any of the, the evidence that has been marked in these photos, is that correct? I'm sorry? Did you, did you touch any of the, the evidence that we went through physically, or did you obtain any of it? Um, the only evidence that I personally collected myself would have been on April 1st with the fibers that were out, outside of the vehicle on the passenger side door and then the uh, apparent palm print that I applied fingerprint powder and lifted from the passenger side door. And, and that is all standard procedure? Correct. And you were wearing gloves when you had lifted that piece of fiber? Correct. No further questions, Your Honor. Thank you. Counselor Jan? Yes, Your Honor. Not very many questions. Thank you. Uh, Agent Kelly, 
Uh, there was also a gun found in this vehicle, correct? Correct. And where was that found? That was in the front driver's door pocket, I believe. And you know what the gun was? What kind of caliber? I did not know. I did not collect it. I believe it was collected. Was it seized? I believe so. All right. So just to kind of sum up, there were multiple swabs taken after you got to the BCI offices on April 2nd, correct? Correct. Just looking at the evidence inventory, uh, everything was collected by uh, Leonard's, correct? Except for the two items you described. Correct. And the one was taken on April 1st? The, the fibers fibers from outside the vehicle yes right and then there was a palm print you said correct so looking at the swabs just to be clear there's the first four on the inventory list are from the driver's door and then there's items six seven and eight from the passenger's door correct I I, I would have to take, I do not have the oh, evidence is that one sheet in front not of me. still up there this is the one that I have is only from the fibers that I collected on April 1st. I do not have the evidence inventory from April 2nd. Okay. Well, you would recognize it if I showed it to you? I believe so, yes. We have an extra one I can use. You may approach. because the print was bigger. <laughs> um, you have it in front of you, though, the the, uh, the inventory sheet from the RJR Dodge truck, correct? Yes, sir. So the first four uh, were on the driver's door, correct? Correct. And then six, seven, and eight were on the passenger's door, correct? Just six, excluding five, correct? Yes. 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 I'm not sure what five is. That's a control swab. Where is that taken from? That is just a, um, basically the type of swab that we use. It is simply submitted as part of it so that uh, any lab analysis will have uh, original pristine swab without any collection of any of the samples. So there's not a sample in number five? Correct. And then 10 and 11 and 12 are also on the driver's, well, I'll take, I'm sorry, I'll we'll start over. 10 and 11 are on the driver's door. Correct. 12 is on the driver's armrest. Correct. 14 is on the steering wheel. Yes, sir. 15 is on the gear selector. Correct. 16 is a swab from the steering column. Correct. And 17 is from the center council. Correct. <coughs> Says swab from center council, is that correct? Yes. And then 18 and 19 are the keys. Correct. And those would have been tested as well, correct? I, I not, have no I shouldn't idea say about what. tested. They were, they were, swabs were taken from them. I don't, I think the keys themselves were just collected. I don't know okay. if any swabs were taken. All right. So ultimately the significance of all of this is you take these swabs and you secure them appropriately following standard evidence collection procedure and you ultimately turn them over to in this case, a special agent of RENS for further processing, correct? For custody, yes. Yeah. How many fibers do you suppose blew away on April 1st when you were trying to collect them with the sterile tweezers? Of the ones that I was attempting to collect? Yes. Just the one. The ones that, that flew away, blew away. It w was it? It was just the one that was in that image. So it was the one larger one to the left of that image? Uh, it would have been the larger one that was in between the seam of the uh, chrome door handle and the plastic molding. Okay. And what you did seize was at the very top of that photograph that was very hard to distinguish, correct? There is a couple, at least a few smaller, considerably smaller fibers okay. in that chrome. And a total of how many? I couldn't even tell you. Less than five? I have no idea. Okay. And those were obtained not from the 
uh, from the tweezers because that was didn't work very well, but from some lift tape. Correct. And when it's on the lift tape, I assume it stays on the tape. Yes. Okay. Now, as I understand it, multiple people drove this truck, correct? I have no information on who all drove it. I'm assuming you're talking prior to, say, right. April right. 1st. Right. It was an RJR vehicle assigned, apparently, to the Cobbs, but you don't know necessarily have, who drove it. I have no information on that, no. Okay. Anything else? That's all I have, Judge. Thank you. Any read, Rick? Just one question. Um, when you use lift tape, could placing a piece of that lift tape when you pull it up to grab one piece, could it also grab additional pieces that you might not see in that area? Yes, it does um, grab other things. That's one of the benefits to using lift tape is if it isn't uh, visible to the naked eye, you may be able to uh, collect stuff. Not only necessarily fibers, there might be, uh, I mean, we've all obviously had tape in our hands and it sticks to everything so it grabs anything that's there sometimes that's beneficial because there's things that you didn't see other times it grabs you know debris that you would prefer not to have i have no further questions your honor thank you request no thank you thank you you may step down you may Does the state have another witness to call today? Yes, Judge. The state calls, excuse me, the state calls Special Agent Patrick Lennertz. Agent Lennox, you come forward. I'm going to have the oath administered again. I know you testified yesterday, but. Do you swear to testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so if you got? Yes. Thank you. Have a seat, please. State may examine. You are Supervisory Special Agent Patrick Leonard, is that correct? That's correct. And you had previously testified in this case. Just to refresh for the jury, um, what is your training and experience in law enforcement? I have just, uh, I've exceeded or in excess of 2,600 hours of post board approved training. The training uh, includes anything from uh, patrol related duties, first aid, um, search and seizure type um, law. There's 400 hours at National Forensic Academy, uh, 400 hours at uh, the Texas DPS Polygraph Academy, and then um, various other crime scene related uh, trainings. Do you have training in obtaining evidence at a crime scene? Yes, I do. Can you move my phone closer, please? And you work for BCI, is that correct? That is correct. And you assisted, did you assist in the processing? of the RJR Dodge pickup on April 2nd of 2019? Yes, I did. And where had that taken place at? It was taken place in a, a storage facility that BCI had uh, rented or leased at the time. Um, and it was something that we had secured um, that piece of evidence in there. And what was your assignment on April 2nd? Uh, on April 2nd, uh, we decided that I was going to uh, do any sort of collection of uh, trace evidence uh, on or inside the vehicle. And what evidence did you obtain? There were several uh, swabs for DNA. Um, there were a fingerprint lift. There was uh, what appeared to be fiber lifts. Um, there was also a handgun that was seized from inside the vehicle as well as uh, sets of keys, two sets of keys. Was that evidence documented in any documents? Yes, it was documented on an evidence inventory form. And have, have you reviewed that evidence inventory form? Yes, I have. Your Honor, may I approach with what's been 
marked as State's Exhibit 230. You may. I mean 930. I'm sorry, Judge. You may. Get a second to review that document? Yes, I did. And what is that document? This is the evidence inventory receipt, evidence inventory and receipt form uh, that was filled out uh, when we had processed the RJR Dodge pickup. And does it include the dates? Yes, it does. Uh, does it include what evidence you had obtained? Yes, it does. Does it describe where it was obtained? Yes, it does. Um, is it fair and accurate to uh, representation of the process that you took, where you took those items on April 1st or April 2nd of 2019 as to the RJR vehicle? Yes, it does. Your Honor, at this time, I'd ask that uh, State's Exhibit 930 be admitted into evidence at this time. That's the one you gave us last night. All right. No objection. 930 uh, is received. Special Agent Leonard, you had described that you had received some training as to how to obtain evidence at a crime scene, is that correct? That is correct. <coughs> what is the process that you're taught in ensuring that um, none of the evidence gets contaminated? It, it really is it has to do with the context of what evidence we are collecting, um, but the general sense of collecting evidence uh, does require us to wear gloves and maybe any other protection depending on the context of the room that we're in or the location. Did you wear any gloves or protection while you were obtaining the, these evidence? Yes, I wore latex gloves. And would you switch your gloves at all when you would take a new piece of evidence? Yes. And is that standard procedure? Yes, especially for DNA. Uh, given that you had obtained these um, pieces of evidence, how were they secured? The, uh, the swabs that were taken are cotton tipped uh, on wooden dowels. And so once the swab was taken, uh, the dowel can be retracted into a plastic, uh, into a plastic container with that, which has a lid on it. The lid is then secured. And then that swab can then be placed into an envelope and secured from there. Was all the evidence that you obtained on April 2nd, 2019 secured? Yes. Judge, I have no further questions of this witness. Cross exam. Just a couple of questions. Agent um, Leonard, what kind of handgun was this? I believe it was a Taurus handgun. I don't recall the maker, or, I don't recall the model. Okay. Or the caliber? Correct. All right. I have no further questions, Judge. Redirect? No redirect, Judge. <coughs> Thank you. You may step down. Does the state have any other witnesses today or? We're going to rest Judge, that concludes the, the rest of my witnesses that I had today. Do we have any other witnesses today? Your Honor, the next witness would be uh, Dr. Masello, and as we spoke about earlier. Okay. Members of the jury, the next witness is going to be a longer witness, uh, longer than the uh, half hour or so we'd have left for today. So uh, it probably makes more sense. Uh, uh, from an evidentiary standpoint to start with that witness on Monday morning. So we will uh, recess uh, for the day and for the week. Um, again, please heed the admonition to not discuss the case amongst yourselves or with anyone else. Do not form or express any opinions about the case until it's given you for your determination. Uh, you'll be uh, home, I assume, for the weekend, so uh, please uh, take care not to view any news stories or read any news stories about this case. Again, don't search the internet or social media or do any research uh, into this case. Again, we uh, need you to keep uh, your mind clear of outside influences so that you can decide this case strictly on the evidence that's presented here in this courtroom. Uh, with that, you are uh,
free for the day. You're uh, excused for the day. You can uh, go and enjoy your weekend. Thank you. All right, so you have been watching our live coverage inside a North Dakota courtroom where a chiropractor and veteran stands trial for quadruple murder. We were just listening to Pat Leonard, some blood pattern analysts who previously testified taking the stand once again after being recalled in this case. We're going to break down uh, that testimony and much more ahead right here on Court TV, your front row seat to justice. Welcome back to Court TV Live. We have been bringing you live gavel to gavel coverage from North Dakota, where we've been following the case against a chiropractor and veteran named Chad Isaac, who is accused of quadruple murder. So earlier today, you just saw the testimony of Pat Leonard uh, with the Bureau of Criminal Investigations, a blood pr pattern analyst, and he was recalled to the stand. And that follows uh, several other witnesses who took the stand on behalf of the state today. And in fact, it's 20 witnesses so far as the state has continued to lay out their case. Of, of course, the defense has been arguing that the state has not provided sufficient physical evidence to actually convict their client. Um, they're also arguing that there is no known motive, and that's something that investigators have admitted in this case. Uh, we also have been hearing from the widow of one of the victims who took the stand yesterday as well. So there's a lot to break down as we keep following this case, this quadruple murder in the town of Mandan, North Dakota, something very unusual there. Uh, also, we are following several other major cases here at Court TV. Uh, apart from the case in North Dakota, we are also following a case out of Tennessee, a man convicted of killing a sheriff sergeant in line of duty, and Chad Daybell facing the death penalty in his trial. Much more ahead on Court TV Live. Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Joy Lim Nacker, and we continue following the latest out of North Dakota, where a chiropractor and veteran stands trial accused of quadruple murder. The state resumed its case against Chad Isaac today by putting the lead case agent on the stand. Special Agent Joseph Ahrens with the Bureau of Criminal Investigations described the scene of a struggle which ended in a violent death. Special Agent Aarons, when you first observed that hat at the crime scene, what did you notice about it? That it was lying on the floor next to uh, William Cobb's head, and it was actually another agent that we were standing there looking at it, and he observed and pointed out something to me on that hat. What was he able to observe? He observed what he believed to be a bullet hole in the left side of that hat. As you look at that hat today, are you able to see that hole? I am. It might be difficult for the jury, but would you be able to hold that item up for them and point to where that hole is located? So here's the hat itself. Um, let's see if I can... Right there, I know it's hard to see, but is a hole in the band of that hat. Okay, so still with us, we have L.A. County Deputy Public Defender Philip Dubé, also trial attorney Nicholas Fortuna joining us once again. Um, so you're hearing Nicholas on the stand, that investigator describing um, the bullet in the hat and, you know, just details of this really horrific crime scene. Um, what else do you think that the state needs to present? Well, the, you know, so far what they're doing is... Uh, uh, explaining how they collected the evidence, what the procedure was to thwart any uh, attempt by the defense to say that the evidence was contaminated. They want to make sure that they uh, are clear with the jury that the uh, uh, evidence was collected in a professional manner and that, that it wasn't adulterated in any way. The next step would be to connect the evidence to the defendant. Right now they're just talking about what they're finding, what what the condition was and how they preserved it. Yeah, and you know, something that, that's something actually that Philip and I were discussing um, earlier in, in, this, in this broadcast. Uh, what do you think, Philip? I mean, do you think that they're just kind of setting the stage to then bring in uh, some kind of forensic analysis that's going to back up basically everything that they've stated in opening statements? 
Oh, yes. Yeah. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. There's more to come, believe me. And I'm not even 100% sure what it is. But my hunch is that if you recall, one of the uh, investigating officers said that a partial print was recovered, but there was insufficient ridge detail uh, to get a good enough print to make a match. However, what they did do is they lifted uh, possible touch DNA off of that print. And you got to keep in mind, this was processed off a company car, a company for which this Dr. Isaac doesn't work for. I mean, that's just simply not his employer. If his touch DNA is somehow associated with that truck, he better have a twin brother. Then there was blood recovered, if I recall, where that print was. If they have a DNA mixture of a victim's blood and Dr. Isaac's touch DNA, that's proof beyond a reasonable doubt, at least to one of the uh, victims, and he'll be in jeopardy. Yeah, you know, but I am curious to see whether they are going to have that sort of evidence because uh, the defense basically argues that there is a lack of DNA evidence. The defense said in their opening statements that the clothes have no blood, that there's no DNA from uh, their client's fingernails and, and the victim's fingernails, and that the state really has not closed the gaps here. Um, do you think, I want to go back to you, Nicholas, do you think that if those dots are going to be connected, we would have seen more in this groundwork phase, if you will, um, being laid out. Well, yeah, I was thinking that. I was thinking there's so many pieces of evidence, it would have been easier if the prosecutor can, at the time that he introduced the evidence and, and introduced how it was preserved, talked about was it connected to the defendant? Did it match the defendant? Did you find any DNA? So uh, that raised a question in my mind as to whether or not they had that evidence. Yeah, and I have, that, I have that same question as well. Uh, we'd like to play a clip from Aaron's testimony earlier today where he also describes kind of signs of a struggle. Let's listen. Were you also looking for any signs of struggle? Yes. Were there any signs of struggle within Bill and Robert's office? Yes, there was. What did you see? Um, I saw a fire extinguisher lying on the floor in the office, which appeared quite out of place and uh, another thing I saw was there was a chair that was sitting in between the two desks and that chair was tipped over and when you looked at where that chair was up on the wall where the chair would have been close to it appeared that that chair had hit that wall with some force because it caused um, the sheetrock to dent or left an impression in the sheetrock where it appeared that chair had hit. Yeah, so again, uh, that's Joe Ahrens. He's the lead case agent. He is with the Bureau of Criminal Investigations there in North Dakota. Um, you know, Philip, of course, we are hearing more about how, how gory this scene was. It was clearly a, a scene of, of carnage. Um, but for me, I'm just, I'm just not seeing it yet, how, how they're connecting the dots. What, what do you think? Oh, no, no, it's just too soon. You know, you got to give them a chance to piece it all together, right? They're laying the groundwork for it. Um, what they should have done has been a little more clear in their opening statement, because that is the roadmap of where the evidence is going to lead this jury. So, uh, yeah, it was probably a little unclear. But my hunch, my gut says that it's going to point to Dr. Isaac. Otherwise, they wouldn't have filed a quadruple homicide. Uh, it's very common that most law enforcement agencies have their own forensic garage or contract with private garages for law enforcement to use to process vehicles. And what they're doing is they're going through step by step the collection of all this evidence, including the prints, uh, the biological evidence, whatever serological evidence. And now I suspect that the linkage is coming in. Okay. Um, we also have a, a piece of testimony from uh, Joseph Ahrens from earlier in the day where he describes basically blood dripping from one of the victim's glasses. L let's listen. Special Agent Ahrens, since it was raised, was there a need to test this item at the lab? No. Would you be able to hold up that item for the jury? Yes. Thank you. You can put that away. In the previous photo exhibit that we were able to look at, 
exhibit 154, we were able to see some blood on the lenses. It appeared that it was dripping. Why would blood be dripping on those glasses? At some point, blood came into contact with those gla the lenses of those glasses. Looking at that physical evidence, the actual glasses in person here in court today, it's more difficult to see the blood. It may be a strange question, but why could that be? Because the blood dried. Um, it may have lightened up a little bit as it dried, and you're looking at it on a clear surface, so you just don't have that contrasting background. So obviously some very graphic uh, imagery there. Um, Nicholas, you know, when you're listening to kind of how this crime um, you know, unfolded, you're hearing a combination of, of stabbing and, and, and shooting, and you're hearing a really gory scene. So my question to you is, does it look like these were well thought out murders? It, it comes across as, as like a, a, a moment or more than a moment of, of rage on behalf of the person who committed the crimes. You know, the evidence suggests that, that they were killed by the uh, gunshot wounds. And then in some instances, the stabbings occurred after uh, the person was dead. Um, and in one instance, it's been reported that there were 48 stab wounds that occurred. and and. They believe that it was after the person had died from the gunshot wounds. So it sounds like someone was raging, or, you know, in this case, the defendant was raging at the time that they were committing the murders. Yeah, so, uh, Philip, that is kind of what, what the issue for me is. You know, you, you described, Nicholas, and I agree with you, what seems like kind of a fit of rage that would have led to this kind of crime. And then, you know, the defense has presented this evidence that this company, RJR Management, had 50 lawsuits during 2019, um, which is when this these murders occurred, that the company carried out routine evictions every year, and then after evicting their tenants, would go on to auction off their belongings, so alienated a lot of people. And then you've got this, this uh, narrative, and actually it's fact that this defendant had a, a, a pretty good relationship with the management company, was really kind of a model tenant, paid on time, had no issues with them, a veteran, a well-respected chiropractor. So how does that fit with a, a fit of rage? You know, well, right now... Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, yes, please. You... Philip or Nick, I apologize. <laughs> The question, the question uh, is, is an important one because there's no motive, evidence of motive uh, presented in this case. And, and you would think that if you have such a bit of rage going on in, in the scene, um, that the juror, jury would want to know what the motive is. I think that's a, a weak point in the prosecutor's case. It's something the defendants could explore, especially if there is no... Uh, Forensic linkage, forensic evidence linking the defendant to the evidence that they described that they collected. Philip, what do you think? If they don't have a motive and they don't have any forensics and they don't have a confession, this doctor is going to walk out of court a free man. I just think we're all being a little uh, impatient because I I trust that more evidence is coming. Otherwise, they wouldn't have filed this case. Okay, so suppose that more evidence is coming, and yet the defense has this uh, really kind of cohesive theory, alternative theory, of all these possible suspects, these tenants who have been alienated by this management company. Um, Philip, do you think that that uh, can combat what the state is presenting? Well, it depends. Uh, the time of death was like, you know, six something in the morning, when he is apparently seen going into the management company office on video. I believe that's gonna be coming soon. And he better have a darn good reason as to why he's going in there at that odd hour. That's for starters. And then number two, the person is only there for 13 minutes and the person who went in is wearing clothes that seems to match Dr. Isaac's clothes that are in his washer and dryer at home. So uh, it's a very tight timeline. And unless he's got an alibi or uh, you know, can point to some third party that was involved or has a twin, uh, I think uh, he is in jeopardy. 
Yeah. All right. Well, thank you both for your expertise. Um, and of course, we look forward to getting more of your thoughts as we break down some of our other top legal stories here on Court TV. Still ahead, breaking new developments in the doomsday couple murder case. Chad Daybell could face the death penalty when he goes to trial. We take a closer look at that and all the latest here on Court TV, your front row seat to justice. Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Joy Lim Nacro, and we're following breaking news out of Idaho right now. Chad Daybell could face the death penalty when he goes on trial for the first degree murders of his wife, Tammy Daybell, and the children of his current wife, Lori Vallow Daybell. 16 year old Tylee Ryan and seven year, seven year old JJ Vallow were found in July of 2020 in shallow graves on Chad's property. While their causes of death are still being investigated, JJ was found in, a plast in plastic and duct tape while Tylee's remains had been dismembered and burned. Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow Daybell were indicted and charged with the murders in May. His trial is scheduled to begin on November 8th. Court TV will bring you live gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage when that happens. Lori's case has not been scheduled at this time because the court found that she is currently incompetent to stand trial. Prosecutors say they consulted with the immediate family members of Tylee Ryan, J.J. Vallow, and Tammy Daybell as they weighed the decision to seek the death penalty and that they, quote, determined that the nature and magnitude of these crimes warrant the possibility of the highest possible punishment punishment, end quote. Now, Chad and Lori Daybell's indictment details how investigators believe they met in October of 2018 and then bonded over the shared extreme religious beliefs that they had. Court TV's Ted Rollins takes a closer look at what we know about them. Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow's extreme beliefs about the end of the world, as described by their friends, are now clearly part of the investigation into the deaths of Lori's children, J.J. and Tylee, Lori's ex-husband, Charles, Chad's wife, Tammy, and Lori's brother, Alex Cox. We're gathering together as saints, as brothers and sisters, and preparing for the second coming of Christ. We want to be there together and we want to be there strong together. That's Lori Vallow on a podcast in November of 2018 discussing the end of times. A few months later, this is what Lori's now dead husband Charles told police in Arizona about how Lori's religious beliefs had become disturbingly extreme. Her religious stuff has gone way off the deep. She threatened me physically. She made threats about the kids. She doesn't care what happens to them. Come get them. I don't care. Uh, we won't care that much longer anyway. And I'm going to back to my God and always on the kids if I want. Anytime I want. It's just irrational stuff. Yeah. She needs some serious help. Uh. I want her to get help. I'm worried about her. Both Lori and Chad told friends and family that they are part of the 144,000, which is a biblical reference from the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation has a chapter in which it talks about how when, when Jesus comes back to the earth or, or in anticipation of that, then there will be 12,000 elders or members from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. And so when you do 12 times 12,000, that's how you get to 144,000. According to friends, Chad believes that he and Lori are not only part of the 144,000, but that it's up to them to lead the other chosen ones after the second coming of Christ. I've recently released my autobiography entitled Living on the Edge of Heaven, where I tell more about my two near-death experiences. And That's Chad Daybell talking about his books on a website called Preparing a People. The video has been removed in his books, Daybell claims that near-death experiences, the first one he was a teenager diving off a cliff, gives him the unique ability for visions, a sixth sense of events that will happen or are about to happen. According to his friends, Chad had visions that his wife Tammy was going to die, that Charles Vallow's body had been taken over by a zombie, and that Lori's children, 7-year-old JJ and 16-year-old Tylee, were also zombies. Chad, according to friends, also believes that he's had many previous lives and has even been married to Lori in past lives on different planets. Chad told his friend Julie Rowe he was James the Less or James the Just, one of the 12 apostles. He started telling me about how he had had, had an, an attack. He was in his living room in Rexburg, Idaho. The way he described it was that 
his veil was more open than it had been, and he started remembering some of his past lives. How and why Chad and Lori's religious views became so extreme is unclear. Friends of both say something changed. Uh, Chad's been a very prolific author, so in the past, I would say a lot of his publications are very much in the mainstream, but it does seem that the, the recently, uh, the, the, their trajectory seems to be taking them away from the, the kind of center where most people in the faith would have. Now, both Chad and Lori are sitting in Idaho jail cells waiting for trial, or if they still believe it, the end of the world. Okay, so still with us, we have L.A. County Deputy Public Defender Philip Dubay and also trial attorney Nicholas Fortuna. So what do you think about this new development, Philip, that uh, Chad could face a death penalty? Well, yes, because keep in mind that both of Lori's children were found buried in his backyard. His wife uh, was uh, or died, for lack of a better term, but her body was later exhumed. And uh, he was prosecuted now for that death, which suggests that they have a new cause of death, that it's a homicide. So, uh, you know, right now you have a uh, triple homicide. And uh, I can't imagine what her defense is going to be other than, you know, she was under the uh, influence, if you will, under the duress of a charismatic cult leader that he brainwashed her, that she drank the Kool-Aid, but yet she was convinced that her children were, you know, the devils of witchcraft uh, in the form of zombies, and therefore they needed to die. A jury is going to take unkindly to her if she doesn't tender a really solid mental defense. Yeah, and, and let's just, I want to remind our viewers that Lori, um, her, her case is on hold right now because uh, of her mental status. She was found incompetent to stand trial. Um, but going forward, Nicholas, what do you think that we can expect her to face? Well, at some point, they'll keep testing her until she uh, they find that she knows enough to assist in her defense. It's a low level uh, uh, that she has to meet as far as uh, competence or ability to uh, understand uh, the charges against her. So it's likely that she will uh, face charges, face a trial. And, and I agree that uh, she better have a strong case of, uh, you know, insanity or something along those lines uh, to, to before, before uh, otherwise she's going to face serious yeah. problems. Yeah, and, and she is receiving uh, mental health treatment at the Idaho Department of Health and Welfare. And, of course, as you mentioned, she will be going on trial once she is declared mentally fit to do so. Um, but, Philip, I want to ask you, if and when she, you know, is declared mentally fit, she does go on trial, could that impact the possible penalties that she could face? In other words, would she face the death penalty since she's got this history on record uh, of mental illness? Well, assuming she is restored to competency, she stands trial and a jury convicts her in the guilt phase, and now she is facing the death penalty at the penalty phase, um, she is going to be putting on mitigating evidence during that penalty phase. At that point, the prosecution has to prove that all the aggravating factors surrounding the commission of the crimes outweighs any mitigating factors. The mitigating factors will encompass her mental health history, uh, the travails of her life, uh, the fact that she went untreated, and perhaps they could even bring in her treatment providers at the state level who restored her to competency to explain how quickly she responded to meds and that she's a good candidate for ongoing treatment. And while she might not ever be free again, they could at least, you know, render a mercy verdict and a life verdict and spare her life, but behind bars. Mm, I see. I see. Well, thank you both so much for your analysis. Uh, we have much more ahead. And, and Nicholas... Uh, we look forward to getting more of your analysis. Philip, thank you so much for being with us. Um, ahead, the Jinx murder trial, of course. Robert Durr set to take the stand in his own defense. We're going to break down what happened in that L.A. courtroom just this past week. We also preview what's expected to be a dramatic week ahead. You're watching Court TV, your front row seat to justice.
Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Joy Lim and We continue following the Jinx murder trial out of Los Angeles. Now, court is dark today, but it is scheduled to resume on Monday after abruptly ending early yesterday. Court TV has just learned that yesterday, in the middle of testimony, the judge was informed that an individual who was present in the courtroom had tested positive for COVID-19. Now, the judge immediately excused the jury for the weekend, and we're told this person is not a member of either trial team. The court has determined that the circumstances around that COVID positive individual did not warrant a further recess of the trial. Court is expected to resume on Monday now. And this week, we waited to hear from real estate heir Robert Durst himself and take the stand in his own defense. His legal team had announced earlier this week that they had planned to call him to the stand either Wednesday or Thursday this week, but it still has not happened. The state continues its lengthy and often contentious cross-examination of memory expert Dr. Elizabeth Loftus on Monday. The defense called her to the stand to challenge testimony of the many state witnesses who claim that they remember conversations from decades ago pointing to Robert Durst's guilt. Uh, after 11 weeks of testimony, the state finally rested its case in chief on Tuesday. Let's take a look back at some of the key moments throughout the trial for the state. So it's going to be three killings that we are going to prove. The evidence in this case is going to show that he is responsible for the disappearance and the death of his missing wife, Kathy McCormick Durst. Can you tell me what was Kathy Durst like? Um, kind, thoughtful, intelligent. Very pleasant, very nice, very um, engaging socially. She was um, totally focused on becoming a physician. Bob Durst was admittedly controlling. And this is not my perception or my description. This, again, comes directly from Bob Durst himself. Well, I was always, always, always very controlling um, in terms of the stuff that's out there that I tried to get her out of medical school and that I wouldn't pay her tuition. I wouldn't pay her tuition because she'd hired a lawyer. Seeing the story about the hair two different ways. One way, I drag her out of the house by her hair. The other way, I grab her hair and a big chunk comes out. Is there a particular reason you remember this particular date of January 31st, 1982, all these years later? Because on February 1st, it became a very important night because Gilberta could not find Kathy. Can you describe what you saw about the house at that time that was different than how it usually was? Um, there was something on the dishwasher. It looked like blood. Did you make an attempt to, to try to identify whose belongings those might have been in the trash compactor? Yeah, I picked up a book. Okay, what, what type of book? I think, like it was a a I think it was a notebook or a textbook. Okay, and what did that tell you? It had Kathy's name in it. Tell us what you remember about this call. The woman stated that she was Kathy first and that she would be absent. No call between January 30th at 9.01 a.m. and 2, February 3rd at 3.10 p.m., no such call connected, correct? Correct. We're going to show that Robert Durst murdered his close friend and confidant, Susan Berman. And we're going to show that he did that with the motive and because she was a witness, and by witness meaning that she assisted him in covering up the killing of his wife almost 20 years earlier. What did Susan tell you about her relationship with Bobby? Best friend, adores him like family. I knew she had been the spokesman for Bobby. She had talked about that a great deal. When Bobby was asked her to or needed her to, she made this phone call to Albert Einstein and Kathy's name. Did she communicate to you that because her friend had not been as generous with the money as she expected, that she was getting to a position where she was going to tell what she knew? Yes. Well, can you please explain that? Okay. Well, she indicated that someone was coming to town 
and that she was going to blow the case wide open. Susan told me that she'd been contacted by Los Angeles detectives and New York detectives. Susan lied to you about that. Susan was trying to subtly squeeze you for money. Do you wish eventually you had had an opportunity to ask her some questions you'd like to ask her? Absolutely. And what prevented you eventually from doing that? She was murdered. Well, I, I thought that when we responded, someone either left the door open or they, you know, they rushed out the house and left the door open. I was not thinking that it would be a dead body inside. How certain are you as you sit here today that Susan Berman told you that her friend Bobby was coming down to Los Angeles around the holidays? I've never been more certain about anything in my life. He was supposed to come. Somebody could have gone into the house and saw that Susan was lying there. Right, right. And, and you agree that you, you, that did not happen. You did not drive down there and find Susan's body, even though you were not the killer. I'm not going to agree to anything like okay. that. The killer left a note, what's been commonly referred to as the cadaver note. And that was mailed to the Beverly Hills Police Department. And it was found prior to Susan's body being located. So meaning because her body is in the house, that the only person who could have sent that note had to have been her killer. Whoever wrote the note was a part of killing her. Yes. You, you agree, right? Yes. No question, right? Whoever wrote that note had to be involved in Susan's death. Okay. A couple of weeks before trial started, he admitted in a stipulation, yes, I wrote the cadaver note. Finally, we're going to show that Robert Durst killed, dismembered, and dumped Morris Black's corpse, his body parts, in trash bags into Galveston Bay in September of 2001. Did you find out that there was a reinvestigation into uh, Kathy's disappearance? I did. I saw a piece in the New York Times about it. I intended to go to Galveston and hide myself and never use the, ner the name Robert Durst again. Do you see Morris Black? Well, several times I saw him coming in and out. A surgeon would, would cut up a body the same way you, you, you do a chicken. Why did you decide that Channel View would be the perfect spot to leave Morris Black? You could get close to the water, get the car close to the water, and walk to the water and nobody would see you. He wanted to make his body disappear, and he wanted to make it look like Morris had just walked away from his old life. The evidence will show that that's the same thing he did to Kathy Durst 20 years earlier. Okay, so let's bring back in trial attorney Nicholas Fortuna. Um, and we are highly anticipating Robert Durst taking the stand himself just to, to track what he says in his own defense and how that all goes. What do you think we can expect? Well, there's an arrogance for a criminal defendant in his position to take the stand, thinking that he is going to turn it all around by um, getting the jury to believe him, like him, or he could persuade them. Um, and one, one thing, it's worked for him once before. He was on trial for murder in, in, in Texas. He took the stand and he was acquitted. Uh, in, this, in this circumstance, I don't think it's a, the same is going to happen. He's not going to be effective on the stand. Um, as far as the defense is concerned, they haven't asserted uh, very much as, as far as uh, an explanation for what's happening other than denying the evidence or saying it's circumstantial. So I, I think he's going to subject himself to tough cross-examination. They have that uh, documentary they did on HBO, The Jinx, and he's made statements on that. Uh, so I, I think it's going to be problematic for him. Yeah, and a reminder for our viewers, of course, Court TV will bring you live gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage, uh, so you will get to see Robert Durst take the stand in his own defense here on Court TV. Now, we just played some of those clips from the key moments in the trial as the, as the state laid out their case. Um, how do you think they're doing? Do you think that they're, that they're proving what they need to prove? 
It, it appears so. I, you know, one thing that was striking, and I saw this earlier on, that they took on a bigger burden than I think they needed to by saying they're going to prove all three murders. Um, it's enough if they just prove the murder of Berman and give a reason for the murder of Berman and not necessarily have to prove that he killed his wife. Um, just that he's trying to cover up the circumstances of her death. And there was enough evidence, circumstantial and otherwise, that uh, that he was involved and, he, and it would give him a motive. But to, to come out so strongly in the opening statement, I believe, was a mistake. Yeah, yeah, I wondered about that because they're, they're trying to prove three murders that he's responsible for. Morris Black's... Uh, apart from his first wife, Kathy Durson, obviously he was acquitted of killing Morris Black. Um, we want to play a clip also from during the cross-examination of Elizabeth Loftus. You know, it's been very contentious. It's been heated as the state has cross-examined this defense witness, a memory expert. Uh, and at one point, she actually calls the questions convoluted. Let's listen. So here's my question. Did you not understand in the hypothetical I gave you that there was no evidence of contamination. Did you understand that? I believe I did, but your well, questions are so convoluted, it's a little hard to keep track of them. With your PhDs, number 59 on the list, et cetera, you can't track my questions. Number 58. I, I, I'm glad that you are very good on correcting me with that crucial distinction. Nicholas, what do you think of this exchange and these exchanges that you've seen between Prosecutor Lewin and, and this defense, the first defense expert? Yeah, I, I think the, the prosecutor uh, in, in a number of circumstances had to uh, handle hostile witnesses, and he, he, he did a pretty good job, I think. I've seen him um, cross-examine. Uh, he had to call a, a witness to the stand that was a friend of Robert Durst, and, and he was able to cross-examine him because he was declared a hostile witness, even though he called him to the stand. Um, the prosecutor does handle the hostile witnesses pretty well. Um, you know, this is, uh, you know, memory witness is, is a soft science, if, if a science at all. So uh, it's not terrific evidence for... Uh, um, the defendant. And you saw some of the testimony. Uh, the witnesses explained why they remembered this event that occurred so long ago. They had uh, a really good explanation what, what it was that, uh, you know, sort of burned that in their memory and why they could repeat it today accurately. You don't think that his tone could boomerang? I, I've had one of our viewers describe him as, quote, mean. Well, yeah, I think he has a little attitude. Look, look what he's dealing with. He's he's prosecuting someone who, in his statement and his belief, is a cold-blooded murderer and trying to get away with it by calling these witnesses that he finds incredible. So, uh, if he can, uh, if he can, if he can get the jury to believe that they're not credible, they'll forgive his tone. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much for your analysis, and we're going to keep following that case. We also have an update in the case of the former Dallas police officer convicted of shooting and killing an unarmed man inside his own home. There's a decision from the court on Amber Geiger's appeal, and we're going to have the latest here on Court TV Live. Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Joy Lim Nakarin. We go now to Dallas, where former police officer Amber Geiger has just lost her appeal for a new trial. The Texas Court of Appeals ruled that there was sufficient evidence to support her conviction for the murder of murder in the shooting death of Botham Jean. Geiger shot Jean to death in his own home after mistakenly entering his apartment instead of her own. She testified that she thought he was an intruder. During cross-examination by prosecutors, Geiger described how she knew how to shoot to kill, to defuse a threat, and she intended to kill Jean. You shot him exactly where you as a police officer are trained to aim, didn't you? Yes, that's why we're trained. Were you trained to shoot a human being? On, re rephrase that. Where are you trained oh. 
to shoot a human being. In the center mass. That's right. And you're trained repeatedly when you qualify to shoot at an individual center mass if you wish to stop them. Yes, sir. All right, and you know, you know what a bullet is, don't you? I do. So you knew when you were shooting that gun that you were using deadly force against Mr. Jean. At the, yes, it was a threat at the time. Ma'am, will you answer my questions, please? Yes, sir. When you shot at Mr. Jean, you knew you were using deadly force against him. Yes. You know what a bullet can do, don't you? Yes, I do. And when you shot at him twice, you intended to kill him. Y yes, sir. All right. So all this stuff about it being a, a sad mistake, at the moment in time when rubber meets the road, when you pulled that trigger, you intended to kill Mr. Jean. He was the threat, yes, sir. Will you answer my question? When you aimed and pulled the trigger at Mr. Jean, shooting him in center mass exactly where you are trained, you intended to kill Mr. Jean? I did. So now Amber Geiger is serving a 10-year prison sentence, and she'll be eligible for parole in 2024. Let's bring back in trial attorney Nicholas Fortuna. Um, were you surprised that uh, her appeal was rejected? You know, the evidence was there uh, for the jury uh, to to convict her. I mean, the, you saw there that they proved the intent. She, there's no question that she was the one who committed the act. Um, it's a sad case. Uh, it's a, a mistake by her thinking she was walking into her own apartment. Um, and even if uh, the appellate court disagreed with uh, how the jury interpreted the evidence. They're only determining whether there was sufficient evidence to prove each element of the crime that she was convicted of. So what, once they establish that, there isn't much they could do for her on appeal. Yeah. Um, so again, she's going to be eligible for parole in four years. What do you anticipate? I, I you know, assuming she doesn't have any other incidents and any incidents in, in prison she'll probably be get be released and we have another clip from her uh, explaining a little bit more about the the shooting and and she's explaining why she did not assist jean after shooting him let's listen do you recall that this backpack and your heavy vest and your lunch pail was put down next to mr jean Yes, sir. Uh, so you had this right within arm's reach in that five minutes of time when you could have been giving him your full attention. Yes, sir. Inside this backpack, you've got something called combat gauze, right? Yes, yes sir. This is for treating a person who has been injured. Isn't that correct? Yes, sir. And it says on there for temporary external use to control traumatic bleeding. Yes, sir. Would you agree? that Mr. Jean was bleeding horribly from the gunshot wound that you put into his chest. I don't recall much blood, sir. You were able to tell the responding officers exactly where the bullet wound is. How would yes, you sir. have known that had you not looked? I, what do you mean? Like, I knew he was shot somewhere. You told them exactly where like, he was shot. Top left. Right. How would you have known that? if you hadn't have looked to where he had been shot? I knew where he was shot. How, would, how, from the time that you shot him? No, when I turned on the lights. Okay, so did you look at the bullet wound? Yes, I did. Okay, so you knew he was injured with a bullet, right? Yes, I did. And a person bleeds when they're injured with a bullet, correct? Yes, they do. Is there a reason why you didn't use this, this stuff right here, which is designed to control traumatic bleeding? It never crossed my mind. Uh, Nicholas, what, what did you make of that exchange and, and how it ultimately impacted uh, everything that we, we've seen unfold so far? Well, what the prosecutor was showing was that uh, she had the opportunity to possibly help him. If, he, if, he, uh, if she thought he was a threat, he was no longer a threat. Now he was uh, in need of assistance, and she provided no assistance. So that uh, sort of cements what her intent was at the time she shot him. Yes. And, you know, of course, 
we have seen a, a an awakening and a reckoning across our nation regarding police use of force. And I'm wondering how you think that this case kind of falls into that landscape. Well, you know, I, I mean, it's probably, you know, an unfortunate time for for uh, a, uh, an officer like in her situation to be tried because people are not that sympathetic toward police um, in in excessive force cases or mistaken use of force. Um, so, uh, but here, you know, you can see it was a sad case. It's it, she really did think she was threatened that, that somebody was in her apartment. Yeah, I, and you know, there was such a powerful moment when a, a relative of Mr. Jean uh, actually hugged Geiger in open court right in front of the judge. I, I, I believe we, we may have captured that moment, which was moving to so many people here on court TV. Yeah. Um, any any final thoughts as as we look at this uh, at this case unfold and as uh, she does become eligible for parole in 2024? I, just that I, I don't think there's any other recourse for her, and you know, and I do think that she should just work towards uh, you know doing what she needs to do to get get released on parole in four years and and and. and and you know, move on with her life. I think that's about it. And so, what what would that be? What can she do? Well, she she has to stay out of trouble. She can't. She should uh, be as uh, you know. They look to see what kind of prisoner you are. Are you pursuing activities that are constructive um, for yourself for your life afterwards? They want to see that you have some remorse. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your expertise, uh, Attorney Nicholas Fortuna, joining us, trial attorney specialist. So coming up, we're going to have much more from the trial of North Dakota versus Chad Isaac. That's a case of a chiropractor and veteran who's accused of quadruple murder. Court TV's legal correspondent Chanley Painter is joining us live from Mandan, North Dakota, with the latest. So stay with Court TV Live. We are your front row seat to justice.